in the Bible? Exodus, Exodus 20, great. And, and our, our scripture for today is in that 20th chapter of Exodus in verse 14. So listen, if you will, to the word of the Lord. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Let us pray. Dear and Heavenly Father, as we read your word, that is only part of it. The second part is to discern its meaning and make it relative in our lives. During this time of teaching, we pray that that happens, Lord, and that we leave here changed people, that we go into your world and let other people know about your word and your ways, and we do so with love and concern. And it is in Jesus' name that all the Lord's people say. Please be seated. So we do continue our study today of the 10 expectations, and just a really quick rewind, we said that these expectations are associated with our relationship with God and his relationship with us. They are not dependent on that relationship, or that relationship is not dependent on these expectations. They are merely things that help us to have a better relationship with God. And so we come to this seventh expectation, thou shalt not commit adultery. On the surface, it seems very simple. But to talk about adultery, we have to talk about marriage. And now that starts to get a little bit personal. And so there's two ways that, that you can go around about teaching or preaching in the church, and those are it, teaching and preaching. And, and I think there's a discernible difference, and especially when you're talking about something that's as personal as marriage. Preaching is one thing. You know, preaching is what the church has done for a lot of years, and I'm just not concerned that it has all the benefits that it used to have. You see, preaching is, is when a pastor or a lay leader or someone gets up in front of another group of people and tells you what you should be doing, and they often do so and simply base it on nothing more than the Bible says so. The Bible says so, so I'm going to tell you how to live your life. I'm going to tell you how to be married today. How does that sound? I see some people smiling. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm authority on that. The problem with preaching is that it's just that. It, it comes from a position of authority, and it doesn't take into account who you are, where you are in your walk, your past, your present, where you're headed. It's just me telling you what you should do and saying, now go do it. Take this, for instance. I somehow, some way, have taken on coaching middle school boys basketball. Yeah, I know. We can say prayers a little bit later for all that. But. <laughs> and I've come to realize, and not just recently, I've come to realize that, that when you try to preach to middle school boys, it just doesn't work. And this is what preaching looks like when you're trying to coach a middle school boy. You, you take a, any one of them, it doesn't matter, and you come up with this offensive plan, and you say, okay, this is the plan. I want, you to, I want you to receive the inbounds pass. I want you to dribble to your right. I want you to do a crossover dribble to your left. I want you to drive the lane, shoot a bucket. Well, that's great and well if you have a basic understanding of basketball verbiage and you have a basic set of skills in order to accomplish those things, but I'm going to be the first to tell you in case you didn't know, no offense, middle school boys, they are uncoordinated, they don't listen, and they lack most of those skills. And so what you end up with most of the time is failure. But that's a preaching perspective. I, I evidently assumed that those boys knew what I was talking about, knew the verbiage, knew the, had the skill set, and could accomplish those things. And it doesn't work that way. And it's the same way in the church. If I just tell you, this is how your marriage should be, now go do it, chances are it's not going to work. Now teaching, teaching is a whole different perspective. Teaching is when I evaluate you, or those basketball players, when I evaluate you, I learn a little bit about, you, about your background, I little bit, learn a little bit about your skill set, I learn about your demeanor, and oh boy, middle school boys have quite the demeanor sometimes, and once I've realized all those things, then I can create a plan to reach that successful point that I want to get to. And so that's what I hope to do today. I am not here to tell you how to live your marriage. I'm here to help, hopefully help you see within your marriage and to teach you a little bit about God's word in conjunction with that marriage. And so we talk about adultery today. And there's really um, no better place to start than kind of with a definition of adultery, if you will. And so if we go to the next slide, please. Adultery. 
This is my definition. I didn't find this in a dictionary. I didn't, I didn't uh, look it up online. This is my definition, and I'm going to tell you where I got this definition in a moment. But my definition of adultery when it, in the context of marriage is allowing something to exist within the confines of your marriage other than the one. Other than the one. Now, notice one's capitalized. We'll get to that later, but do make notice of that. Adam doesn't like what I'm preaching already. So that's the definition of adultery, and I got this, actually. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me to Genesis 2, the second chapter of Genesis, verses 20 through 24. This is where I got the definition of adultery from. And I'm going to read, I should say 20 through 24. Apparently uh, pastors don't listen either, but... um, I'm going to read this through, and I'm going to really key on three words in verse 24. So here we go. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. We have talked about help meet, and I want you to understand going into this conversation that help meet is an equal. Adam did not have an equal that would fill in the gaps that he had. He did not have an equal partner. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Next slide, please. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe, man, because she was taken out of man. And then we get to verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave. Everyone say leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave, everyone say cleave, Cleave. unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Say one flesh. flesh. These three words, or at least the two words in a phrase, are what really sets the parameters for marriage today. And if we're going to talk about adultery, we have to start with what marriage was designed to be originally. First of all, I want you to understand that God created woman. He did all those amazing things, and then we get to verse 24, and he says, there for that, that word, therefore, tells us that we're about le- ready to learn something important. And what we're about to learn pays homage to everything that we've just read beforehand. God didn't create woman for no reason at all. He created her for a therefore. And this is the therefore. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. I can't tell you how much weight that word leaves means in this verse. Because if you understand a little bit about Jewish life, Jewish society, Jewish culture, everything in the world is built around family. That is absolutely the most important thing to a Jew. They're family. I mean, they are um, sons and daughters, are sons and daughters of their father. They carry his name. Chances are sons are going to follow in the same job description that the father did. When they do get married, they don't move out of the house. They build onto the existing structure, and there they live. Everything is about family in Jewish culture. And so for God to say, therefore, I created this woman for you. Therefore, now I want you to leave everything. This is weighty. And that word leave doesn't just mean, okay, I want to create a distant. He means leave it all behind. Imagine if you stripped naked and you, and you walked out of Wiggins looking for a mate and you walked into some town you've never been in standing there naked. Okay, that'd be funny, yeah. <laughs> you can laugh. But that's kind of what God is telling this, this Adam. He's saying that everything that you were, everything that was important to you, everything that you had, it's gone. Because I created this woman for you. And then God says, now that you've left everything behind, I want you to cleave unto this woman that you found. I want you to grab a hold of her. I really want you to hang on. You know those uncomfortable hugs you get when you meet family members you haven't seen for a while? You know the ones where you get smashed into places you don't want to be smashed into? God says, I want you to hang on tight. I want you to find this mate, this spouse, and I want you to hang on tight. And then here's the most important part. I don't want you to hang on tight just for a moment. 
I don't want it just to be that momentary, uncomfortable hug at Thanksgiving. I want you to hang on so tight and for so long that you become one flesh. This is a picture of what it looks like. <laughs> hey, pictures are always worth a thousand words. I can shut up, right? <laughs> Man, woman, individuals, they travel somewhere, they go somewhere indicated by the arrows, and they become one. And notice that it's half man and half woman. Now, I'm not advocating transgender stuff. <laughs> but I do have a secret to tell you, and this, this is for all people, that if you think you're going to get married and not lose your identity and become the identity of a married couple and make that marriage work over a long period of time, it doesn't work that way. You will still have your identities as individuals within the relationship, but when the world looks at you from the outside, it must see one entity, one flesh. This is what God wanted marriage to be. Leave everything behind, find a spouse, hang on tight, and become one flesh. Now, our subject for today is adultery, and I'm going to finally get to it, believe it or not. But I said adultery was anything that comes within a relationship other than the one, and, and that, that was the one. You're confusing me. You're fine. That was the one, but look what happens when we allow adultery to come into our marriage. See, we had two people, a man and a woman, and, and they, they moved up into the relationship, but now they're not one. Now there's that barrier between them. And that is really what adultery is in a marriage. I know we have our preconceived ideas, and we'll talk in a moment about what they are and about what adultery is. But adultery is anything that takes that, if you'll go back, that one and changes it into the two with something in between it. And so that's the importance of what we're talking about today. Anything that comes between the man and the woman, the man and the woman, a man and a woman, because that is how God indicated he wanted marriage to be, anything that comes in between them is adultery. And so we have three, three very specific types of adultery. And the first one is sexual adultery. And sexual adultery is intimate contact with another. Now, this is what we, I mean, if I asked you what adultery was, this is what 99 out of 100 people, that's a cool, cool picture, huh? 99 out of 100 people would say that adultery is it's having sexual contact with another. I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, I hope, because I think, I hope, everybody here agrees that this is wrong. And strangely enough, all over the world and for throughout all different types of religions and cultures, this is pretty much the mandate. This is pretty much the accepted thing. Even when you start talking about cultures that allow multiple wives, and, and you can look even back to that Jewish nation of Israel, multiple wives, that was not God's intention, but they did, did it anyway. Um, Sex outside of marriage wasn't allowed. So if you were going to have multiple wives, the only way that you could have sex with those women was to make them your wife first. And so the, God's intention was that if you're going to have sexual relationships, it is within the confines of marriage, period. Premarital sex is out. We don't have any need for birth control. It's all gone. There's no point. If we've listened to what God had to say, we'd be a much better place. But I don't want to say too much about this except for this. The, the one thing that I do want to say about this is that there's there's pervasive idea that if I'm in a marriage and my marriage begins to fall apart and I move out or we're separated or maybe she did something that I don't like or he did something that I don't like, that suddenly that frees us from that God covenant thing and sex is okay. The one thing that I want to tell you is that God did not make stipulations when in a marriage extramarital sex was okay. His word was that if you're married to a person until that gavel falls on that bench, and I, I'm not advocating divorce, but that's a whole other idea, but until that gavel falls on that bench and says that you are now divorced, sex isn't okay with anybody but your spouse. So that's sexual idolatry, the one that we're most familiar with. 
Moving on to the second one. Non-sexual adultery. Having wanton eyes. I have, a, I have some scripture for you. I'm going to go to the gospel according to Matthew in the fifth chapter if you want to go with me. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 28. Matthew 5, 27, 28. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Right here in Exodus 20 and 14, Jesus is quoting. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Jesus again in his ministry took the Old Testament law and extended it, made it relevant to our life. And he says that not only is that sexual idolatry not okay, but non-sexual idolatry is not okay too. This adultery thing doesn't have to be sexual in nature. It can be non-sexual. And so men and women out there, this covers things such as bachelor and bachelorette parties. I know that technically you're not married on the night before your wedding, but come on, folks, right? I mean, strip clubs. Sorry, guys, no more strip clubs. Pornography of all kinds, sexually explicit movies, catcalling on the street. When I wrote that down, catcalling, I'm thinking, man, how many people actually know what catcalling is anymore? <laughs> So for you young people who don't know, that's when you see a, a, a good-looking woman or man go by and, and you start, you know, woo-woo, look at that, you know. It was always that, that paradigm of the construction workers on the building, high-rise, you know, and the women walking by in the skirt. But it's just, it's just calling out to anybody that's not your partner about how great they look. Googling babes on the Internet. Oh, I just wanted to see what she looked like. It's okay. I'm not really doing anything. Um, sexting. Now i got to go back to the other generation. Sexting for the older generation is when you send sexually explicit pictures through text messages. That's all the fad now with some of the younger kids. How sad. Or even taking a second glance while walking down the street. Or gentlemen, if you go to Hooters, you are in trouble. That is non-sexual adultery. And Jesus says it's not okay. Why isn't it okay, though? Well, here's what happens with, especially, I'll, I'll use pornography, for instance. Pornography is so pervasive in today's world. When a man or a woman gets online or wherever they get to look at pornography, and they see these things going on and these people in these movies and so forth and so on, they bring an unrealistic vision, expectation, back into their marriage relationships. And that pornography becomes that barrier. So no more are you counting on your husband or your wife to make you happy. You have this unreachable vision of what your relationship is going to look like, what your partner is going to look like, what things are going to be like because you've seen something out there in the world and now you've tried to bring it back into your relationship. And nothing can be more damaging than doing that. You married your husband or your wife for a specific reason. Focus on those reasons. It, that that kind of goes with the whole grass is greener attitude, right? Well, let me tell you something about grass is greener. I've had, had a little bit of experience in this grass is greener thing. The grass is green until you go next door and start living there, and then it dies just like your grass did at home. <laughs> because it's not a problem with the water in Wiggins. It's not a problem with the grass. It's a problem with you. You have unrealistic expectations about your relationship. And you get those expectations somewhere out in the world from this non-sexual adultery category. Non-sexual adultery is the second one. Now we move to the third one, which is spiritual adultery. I'm going to read again a couple um, verses from Matthew. This time I'm going to the 12th chapter of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 and 39. Jesus is involved in his ministry and as always there's always these people that are coming up to him and arguing him about something he said or did or believed in so then certain of the scribes and of the pharisees answered saying master we would see a sign from thee but he answered and said unto them an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet jonas spiritual adultery jesus says that when you stop seeing what's going on in your relationship and you start focusing on you, that that becomes adultery. 
These scribes and Pharisees, they knew what was going on, but they wanted something that was so... They were worried about them. Jesus, give me a sign. Jesus, do something for me. And Jesus says, when you're so blind to what's going on around you, that it starts to affect your relationship not only with Jesus, but with your spouse, that is adultery too. And we see this all the time. We see marriages that were so close to begin with. Remember that, that picture of that half man, half woman? You see, when, when we start out being married, we're very, very concerned about the other's feelings and about their spiritual welfare. But over a period of time, for whatever reason, we start to grow apart and that wall comes in between. And then the only thing we're worried about is me, me, me. And that's spiritual adultery. What was once one now has become, and become two, and all you're concerned about is yourself. There's a wonderful quote that I share with all the, the married couples that I counsel before they get married, and it says that this is a definition of love. I ask them to define love. That's always funny to hear definitions of love. But this is a quote I found, and I love it, and it says, Love is, I want to make sure I get it right, love is by meeting the needs of the other person that you yourself have your needs met. By meeting your needs, that meets my needs. It's about being spiritually involved with the other person, spiritually concerned for their welfare. A lot of us think that if I don't commit sexual adultery and I don't bring pornography or any of that stuff into my marriage, that if I'm faithful, you hear that all the time, well, I'm a faithful husband or wife. Sure, you're there physically, and you're there to listen, but are you there spiritually? What has gotten between you and your spouse that prevents you from being one spiritually? That is spiritual adultery. And I think it's really the most pervasive. I think it's what we see more and more in the world. People are staying married. I'm, I'm just staying married for my children's sake, right? I want to raise my kids. It's what's best for them. They see that. You're giving them an example of what adulterous relationship looks like. And so spiritual adultery is anything that you, does not bring you closer to your spouse. So, John Lowe, golf is great unless you come back from golf angry and upset. And then it's not great because it creates a barrier. And Art Sawal, going to the coffee shop is wonderful unless your wife's at home lonely wishing that you were with her. And anything else that we, and I'm just picking on them guys, but anything else that we have in our life that isn't about us, that doesn't support each other spiritually, is a spiritual adultery. So those are the three types, sexual, non-sexual, spiritual. Now I want to say, before we move on, that, that there is a bigger picture of marriage, and that whenever we teach, if that's what we're going to do, there always has to be a bigger picture in mind. If I go back to that basketball analogy, the bigger picture I would hope would be to develop young boys and girls. I know you thought I was going to say to win. That's not the bigger picture. The bigger picture is to develop those younger boys and girls, give them a work ethic, make them more athletic. And so what is our bigger picture with this adultery thing? Well, it's that our relationship with each other as husband and wife is a direct reflection of our relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Remember I told you that the, the ten expectations were kind of split into, into two groups, the first, the first four and then the last six? But I told you that the last six reflect back on the first four in so many ways? Nothing is more realistic than the seventh expectation, that it reflects back on our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we look at the first expectations, number one and number two, it said, God said, make me number one. He said, I am the Lord your God, have no other gods before me. Make God number one. Make your spouse number one. Expectation number three said, God said, keep your eye on me, have no other idols. In our marriages, keep your eye on your spouse. Don't have anything from the outside brought in. Those unrealistic expectations. Make your spouse your idol, if you want to call it that. Expectation number four says, God said, um, the Sabbath day, God said, make sure that you respect me and spend time with me 
and we're expected to do the same in our marriage. Marriage just isn't a piece of paper. Marriage is about loving the other person and not allowing anything to come between you and that person. That's my message for today. I hope I didn't come across as preaching. Um, I can tell you that I've failed miserably in relationships, as most of us have at one point or another in our lives. And we have to learn. And I hope this touched each and every person out there. If you were a young person listening to this, um, I hope that you got a little bit about what a marriage should be like. And if you're a newlywed person, you know, just newly married not too long ago, I hope that helps you to, to keep in mind and to focus as you move forward in your marriage what a relationship is supposed to look like. And if you've been married for 50 or 60 years, God bless you, first of all. And I want to encourage you to spread your wealth of knowledge to other people. That's what we are supposed to do in the church, to teach each other, to help each other. Let's close with a prayer. Dear and Heavenly Father, Lord, you know how difficult relationships are. You've been attempting to maintain a relationship with us for thousands of years. We know that in the New Testament that Christ is called the bridegroom to the church, that we're married to Christ, that we're his bride. So Lord, we just hope that we take the knowledge from this teaching today. We don't allow anything to come into our marriage that separates us from each other. And we don't allow anything to come in our relationship with you that separates us from you. Lord, I ask that each person here reaches out, helps their brother and sister as they work through relationships, and that they do so with love. And each and every moment brings them closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to take a few moments to say hello to one another. So before we move into our time of prayer, I encourage you to go find somebody that you may not know, say hello, introduce yourselves to them. Time of fellowship. Thank you, brother. <laughs>